Welcome everyone to a trip down Stoner Drive. I am your host Shag Wellenbolt, or you can call me Shaggy. Like zoinks! And this is a platform to tell people stories about how cannabis has positively or maybe even negatively affected their lives. I don't care if you're a patient, a brand, a distribution, an athlete, a politician. If you have a story to tell, I want to hear it. So hopefully this gives you an educating and entertaining look behind the scenes of the booming cannabis industry. And if you like uh, my videos, please give a like and subscribe to my YouTube. Also go to my website, shagwellensway.com, to get your shaggy swag and rock the clothes that you see in my videos. I hope people listening to this know that you do a really good job. Previously with information on a trip you. down you. Stoner I Drive. I have no doubt you will achieve that dream. It's just a matter of when. I appreciate it. It's just telling great stories like yours. And as you mentioned earlier, the goldfish story, which is, I mean... It's the most emotional, but I think it shows the truest of how the smallest animal can mean the most impact on somebody's life. So tell us about this goldfish. If I could, if I could just talk about one thing first before we do that, which will tie in. Um, People are surprised to hear what I'm about to say. Veterinary medicine has uh, unfortunately taken dentists out of the top of a list that none of us ever really want to be on. And that's depression, suicide, and disenchantment. And the veterinary profession of all the healthcare professions has the highest numbers. When I say that, people go, really? I have over, that's the wonderful. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of different reasons for it. And now you're, you know, again, this might be a topic for a different day, but I'll give it just a little bit of insight. Oh, absolutely. You know, people are thinking, well, I'll give you just a couple of clear examples of what plays into that. One of them is we hear about these skyrocketing debts that students come out of, especially professional school, whether it's law school, physicians, dentists, veterinarians, whatever. Let's compare. An internist in human medicine comes out, graduates, does his internship, his residency, and then goes into practice, and he hires maybe three or four people to run his office or her office, and then he uses the hospital. A veterinarian has to buy a hospital. So on on top of that student debt, let's add on another one to one and a half million dollars. That's pressure. MRI machines, x-rays. You name it. They have to have bone plating, surgical suite, everything that a regular hospital has, any veterinary hospital has. So that's one challenge. We love our animals, and thank heavens, they have moved in the past three or four decades from the backyard to the garage to the den to now we're fighting for space on the bed in the bedroom with them. That's wonderful that we've embraced them. And just the difference between, real quick, uh, East Coast to West Coast. When I was in Virginia, the only place I could bring Riley was a brewery. We're the only places I really accepted dogs. Out here in San Diego, there's been maybe two places I've been turned away from when I have my dogs. They're allowed to go to every restaurant with me, like any breweries, everywhere. And it's just so fantastic seeing the difference. And there are those nidises on the East Coast that are getting better. You're right. More conservative slower to change we're a bit more leading the path and that's why we both love living here probably. exactly but um you know so we've gotten the financial issues apart and we started saying you know they've moved into our bedroom people love their animals so you come in and you see the veterinarian and people's expectations of what we can now do for their animal is very high thank heavens mm-hmm. their expectation of what it should cost not so high <laughs> very low yeah and therein lies the rub, because here's the veterinarian, he's trying to put food on the table for his family, pay back that huge loan we just talked about, has the person crying because their animals like their family, but then when he tells them what it's going to cost, they, some of them literally get angry. Yeah. And, you know, so that's one other reason. There's this, 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 this basically um, disconnect. So that adds pressure. And then another thing one wouldn't think about until it's brought to our attention the act of committing suicide, the actual act of doing it, that generally occurs. The decision to finally do it is in the last 45 minutes of a, people's, a person's life. Here's a veterinarian sitting there, possibly in that very depressed, dark place, with a bottle of euthanasia serum right in front of him. We're mm-hmm. good at euthanizing. Yeah. Thank God, because I do think it's a godsend when an animal's suffering, and you can give them a respectful death. Yeah. But that's very enticing to someone who's in a dark place, okay? And so the mechanics of it, the costs, the pressure, the social pressures, all of those things. Now, I don't like to be pessimistic. I talk to my profession now, and the name of my talk is I wouldn't change a thing, which especially given my specific place in life right now and what I'm facing, surprises people, but I really wouldn't. 
I feel like one of the luckiest guys on this planet. I mean, I, for, for decades, I've been able to pursue what my calling was, my passion. I remind my colleagues that 80% of the people in this country go to work to put food on the table and take care of their basic needs. Only less than 20% get to follow their calling. Like you are here and working for it. I'm thankful every day. Oh my to. gosh. I push for it so much know, and I'm thankful. And then to have an impact, not just to have your calling, yeah. but to know that you're helping people. Especially you the impact you've, right. you've provided. For well, many, my, many mine too, but I'm talking about what you do, but also what I did um, or do um, to have that impact. Those are all rewarding things, which is, why is it important? When we talk about that suicide and depression, it's up to us to change that tide. We have to take the time to educate the public. For instance, the catheter that went in your little guy's arm when he had to have his hip fixed. Um, that same catheter is made by the same company that makes them for people. And bacteria and germs and the company that make it don't care. It's going in four legs instead of two. The mm -hmm. cost is the same. So most of the equipment, most of the uh, techniques, the educational level of a veterinarian are all similar to a physician or a dentist or what have you. Um, but we don't have the same kind of insurance to pay for our animals. It's why in my book I do tell people today, if you're getting a new animal to your house, get pet insurance. Sure. It's expensive, but if you don't, and I'm not saying everyone can afford it. No. If you can't afford it, then let's pray for the best. But if you can, I will tell you that there will come a day, not if, when you will be put in a position to make a decision about your animal's life predicated on dollars and cents, which is heart-wrenching. People have to make it. And as a veterinarian, I never had a person extend themselves beyond what they were capable of. What I feel we owe our animals in return for the unconditional love they give us is we should never allow them to suffer unnecessarily. I agree. That might be euthanasia. That might be treating them for cancer. Depends on the circumstances, the resources, the skill of the people involved. Both are, I wouldn't say viable solutions, but both are appropriate and humane solutions. Absolutely. Just don't let them suffer unnecessarily. No, and I can agree to that. I mean, for three months ago is when she broke her leg, and I was almost put in that position. Uh, luckily, we were able to find cost-effective ways with still right treatment to make sure that she it was taken care of. It wasn't expensive for you. No, I know it's just still very expensive. It still cost me just uh, no, uh, almost close a thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah, but it could have cost me up to almost four to five hundred, five grand right. is what they were estimating at some of the vets, and so. Um, it does allow me to have a lot better perspective on it because at first I was, I never got angry at the vets. I understood it was their job, but I was angry outside of the phone calls and stuff. And I was cussing and cursing out the storm and I'm freaking out, honestly, of just how I was going to afford it. Um, I do want people to know there are um, grants, there are uh, loans, there are things that you can uh, get to help with the cost for that. Um, and so those were worth things I, I was looking into until I was able to find the vet down in TJ. Um, but it has me a lot more respect for the vets uh, after having our conversation and understanding the cost of it. Because I was, I do have pet insurance, really good pet insurance, but there are still costs outside of that pet insurance or beyond that that I wasn't quite understanding until this conversation. So Your um, voice is important to be heard then. Because it's one thing for me to talk to, but people will look at me and go, well, he's a veterinarian. He's trying to speak for his own profession. Mm -hmm. As a person who loves his animals and was on the other side of it, hit with those costs, hit with the, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? That means a lot, folks. I would listen to yeah. him as much as <laughs> me. And, and uh, just make sure that you've really thought down the road that when you take an animal into your life, you're taking on a commitment for 10 or 15 years. And it, it is a forever um, home. Um, I have brought Riley with me from across the country, from Virginia, um, there's times that I've had Scooby and I've had to move apartments because of just the place wouldn't allow dogs and then I had to go and get them registered as emotional pets, um, little things, but there was not just, oh, this is hard, I'm giving the dog back or I'm putting her up or anything like that. These are my dogs forever and my family forever. But I, I do want to put in a, a, a little bit of a, a comment here for those people that find themselves in that situation that don't find a solution, okay? Yep. I don't want them to feel, you know, the forever home isn't one that I use that term. Let gotcha. me explain why. Um, I've been blessed, married for 43 years, but we both know lots of people that it lasted two years, five years, seven years, got a divorce. And, you know, even though at the time you took your vows and we said, hey, we're together, good mm -hmm. and bad and different, people change. Life changes. Absolutely. People get sick. People 
economics change. So if a person listening today finds himself or historically had to give up their animal to a humane society or a shelter because they tried their darn best but couldn't find that out a, a way through it, I thank you. Oh, no. Because instead of letting him out in the field, hitting him over the head with a baseball bat, shooting worse, I've seen all these things, unfortunately. A person who came to grips with the fact that, hey, life's changed. I got deployed. My apartment building suddenly they don't allow animals anymore. It's caught up in a divorce. I mean, there's lots yeah. of reasons that some people will find themselves not able to find the best for the animal. So the next thing is to make that very hard decision to give them to an organization that will, in fact, pick it up from there and find another home. And people who do that have a big heart, and they should not feel like they failed. No. As long as they've tried. Um, and I do, sorry, I did want to top on that, I, the Forever Home. Um, I almost had to give up Scooby because the reason Riley broke her leg was because of a scuffle. And it was after I've gone to training and I've uh, tried to do a lot. And then I even looked up people to adopt her. Um, to adopt Scooby and they came by or they were supposed to come by and they canceled and, and then luckily I had a friend that was able to watch her for a week and a half and we separated them and then we slowly reintroduced them back in t with each other and now it's been four or five months they've had no issues whatsoever um, but it's also understanding like I was at almost to the point where I was going to have to do that and also certain points with the cost I was wondering if I was going to have to euthanize Riley just because there's a certain cost of them as well. Like, I, I love Riley. They are my forever home, but or they are my pets. Um, you can use them for, yeah, for, yeah, yeah, for, for me. They're forever. But um, there's also how much in debt can I go and how much can I pull out and how much can I borrow for it to really be effective. So if it was at 4500 unfortunately, I just didn't have the money at the time. I didn't, wasn't making it effective. So I was going to have to either give her to somebody that could fix her or I was going to have to put her down. Um, and it's a tough call to make, but, you know, it's just understanding you have to do what's best for them. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have to say I'm glad that I live in a world where people care that much that those become challenges for us than live in a world where people just dismiss it and say, it's just a dog, get rid of it. And then if you do get euthanized, please be there. That's my biggest thing. Don't let them be alone. Ooh, there's that, another part that I'll have to share my experience with you on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we just went through it. Um, I'm going to try not to let it interfere too much with my ability to communicate today. My family and I just had to say goodbye to not just one, but two dogs that have been in our family a long time. In the past four weeks, my older daughter had a 14-year-old and a half-year-old dog by the name of Rusi. Wonderful Shiba Inu. He was mm -hmm. her shadow. And liposarcoma, cancer on the side. We finally got the best of them three, four weeks ago. Had to be euthanized. Roan was a Malinois Dutch Shepherd. Beautiful dog, protected the whole family. Oh, that bass bark when I walk in their house, I look for. Mm -hmm. And um, he had anal cell carcinoma, like another cancer. We knew it was in his lungs already. We knew we were going to have to say goodbye to both dogs this year. But just like we hear with people, when Brucey's time came and he was euthanized here three or four weeks ago, Roan went downhill so quickly after that that he was euthanized just about two weeks ago. And it's her, it's hard. Um, you know, so. Um, being there is why I'd like to talk to it. My grandson and granddaughter. My granddaughter wanted to be there with Brucey. Mm -hmm. My grandson not. And they're both right. I will take you. Okay. If a person, what I ask a person, I would never say you have to be there because there are some people who if being there are going to be crying and can't control their emotions or they're scared or they just don't want to be there. If they're bonded to that animal, the animal picks up on that, and it makes their process of going across that rainbow bridge harder. So I always ask people, do you want to be, don't go by what okay. anybody else has said. Do you want to be there? Do you want to remember your dog running around the fields? Or would you like to know that you were there in that last moment, holding them, caring for them, and you were able to do that without undue fear and concern? Because if you're too upset, I know I'm going to have a hard time finding that vein. I know that animal's going to be, something's yeah. wrong. You know, John here is upset. I'm upset. Uh -huh. So it somewhat depends on the people and the circumstances. It's good enough. Um, I know my own colleagues would take strong issue with what I just said. You have to get past that. Well, you know, some people can. Yeah. Um, and so it's not fair to the dog. It's not fair to the person. In my case, when we said goodbye to my dog of Rand, 13 and a half years, this is the last dog I had to say goodbye to, I was holding him, 
and a dear friend of mine, Keith Richter, who is the senior veterinarian at the Veterinary Specialty Hospital that people know on the 805 and the 5. But my wife took a long walk. And I don't chastise. That no. was what she needed. She knew there's someone else there, her husband, who's going to make yeah. sure Ren feels okay. Her makeup was such that she thought she would be too much affected, and that would about be in Ren's best interest. So I would say, I, I, it's good I, to not know, to be corrected, yeah. but I just don't want someone to feel like they have to be there. Their makeup is they can't. No, I prefer that, especially somebody that's yeah. been seen those situations seen, hundreds of times. Yeah. I haven't. So, and 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 really, again, like so much we talk about here today, when you make decisions about animals like that, you make them first in the best interest of the animal. Yeah. Um, sometimes that competes with your desires and needs, and sometimes it's in concert with it, but not can't tell when it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, uh, let's go back to the goldfish story because I think that, I mean, this kind of relates extremely to that story. So, Well, and what Chaggy's talking about is um, there's a story in my book about Harold the goldfish. Uh, Harold's the hamster, I'm sorry. Um, the goldfish is named, and I'm forgetting it now, but... I think it was Frank or something. Frank the goldfish, yeah. thank you. Um, an adult woman brought him into my office in a big fish tank, uh, not in the book, by the way, I don't think. It was, it was ironic. It was raining outside, and the attendant that went out to help her brought a gurney out to put the tank on, covered the tank so the animals shouldn't get wet in the rain. Yeah. It's, in a it's a fish tank. Yeah, <laughs> like it's got wet the whole time. Yeah. Um, I thought it was just funny when he came in with the tarp. Right. Why is the tarp? He didn't want to get like, wet. Well, yeah, I guess it did. <laughs> I was like, I didn't say if it's like a seawater <laughs> tank or something like that. But. Um, Anyway, it's a fancy goldfish. They live about 10 to 15 years. They're not your little ones, but they're not the big carp either. They're about sure. this big, beautiful, different colors, See, white. I thought gold. they only lasted like two or three. <laughs> no, 10 or 15 on this one. And I'm dragging this out a little bit so that people listening to us today and viewing this are going, oh, come on, the guy's crossed the line. No. I'm going to change the paradigm, folks. Um, what we're talking about here is within five minutes, I looked at the goldfish and I saw that this big pedunculated tumor off its gills. You know, it's sort of like a mushroom hanging mm -hmm. down. And he was starting to go sideways and can't exist long like that. And the woman changed my whole paradigm at the moment because she said, Doc, my son's autistic. He learned to count watching this goldfish go around the tank. He learned to clean himself cleaning the goldfish tank. He learned to feed himself by how important it was to feed the goldfish. And the last thing he said as mom left, saying he was taking the goldfish to the vet, is what I do wrong, mommy. If there's anybody out there <laughs> listening now, you're in the wrong program <laughs> if I didn't just touch your heart. <laughs> yeah, okay? Um, it changed my mind. I went and found two surgeons. I was in a large hospital, Angel Memorial. Some people from Boston may know it. We had 60 veterinarians. I was lucky to be there. It's a great mm -hmm. teaching hospital. And I found two surgeons. I asked us to give the owner to give us two weeks, talk to the New England Aquarium, found out in the 80s, bromo seltzer worked great as an anesthetic. <laughs> About as great as ether though, the margin of error is very small <laughs> between death and anesthesia. Um, oh, I've been interrupted by much oh, worse good. voice. <laughs> um, I, uh, so we used bromo seltzer. Okay. And effectively, um, uh, we, um, one surgeon was holding him. I had this dilute solution. I was flushing his gills to keep him oxygenated and at the same time anesthetized. Yeah, so the other surgeon it. had to take this thing off and he had to do it meticulously because you couldn't use electric cordery in water mm -hmm. and you can't use cordery power to get in his gills. Mm -hmm. he, he successfully took it off perfectly and he came Steady back hands. as a benign tumor. Mm -hmm. came back as a benign tumor and this goldfish went on to live a normal life. We weren't treating a goldfish. We were mm -hmm. treating a little boy. And that's the human-animal bond that I talk about and so important to me. Um, and it, it occurs with wildlife, agricultural animals, or domestic mm -hmm. pets. Wildlife protect our planet for us. They bring this enormous beauty into the world, this enormous wonderment into the world. We owe them. Agricultural animals give their life up for our food. Our pets give us unconditional love. All of them provide these vital things for us. Well, we have to, there's, there's two ways to this thing. And we negotiated the best deal in the world. We get all of that. And our responsibility is food, water, shelter, or a healthy habitat if they're wild. Yeah. I would argue health care and love. I say it that way because the law right now in almost 50 states, all 50 states, is your obligation is food, water, and shelter. Which is why some people get so frustrated. They'll call the local humane society. My neighbor has his dogs. They're living out in the mud. He throws food out for them, you know. Yeah. That's no way for a dog to live. 
Well, unfortunately, if he's getting food and he's got a shelter from the weather, he's got a bowl of water, that's acceptable by the law. I think we've got to do better. Yeah. But back to what it is, we've made the best deal in history. For all of that, all we have to do is support the animal's health and well-being, and we get unconditional love and a protection of our planet. That's the human-animal bond. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so important to our ecosystem to have to life. Very much so. Gandhi, uh, many people may know this quote, uh, you can judge the moral uh, backbone, and I'm using words differently than he did, but the basis was you can judge the moral background, backbone of a community by how they treat their animals. And it's the same even in a household. When our officers, humane officers, they go in and find animal abuse, and there's children there, you'll find child abuse. You know, when you see these blood sports, oh my gosh, if anybody's listening, and you know anyone that's fighting dogs, cockfighting, bullfighting, they're abhorrent, they're horrendous. And yes, the animals suffer. People don't realize when you talk about cockfighting, and I should point out that about 15 years ago, the Officers of the Humane Society and Department of Animal Services here in San Diego busted the largest cockfighting ring in the history of the United States, 50,000 birds, 10 miles out of San Diego, not across the border. How did people right not here. catch that? It's like, oh, that many birds oh, there's so thing. much space out there. We finally, and then you got to find all the, you got to get all the evidence and... It was a tragic day for us to go in and finally bust it up because we had to euthanize 50,000 birds. You can't put these birds back. Yeah. They are vicious. Yeah, they're very um, kill. And people think, oh, what's a big deal? You're putting two birds in a ring and they punch each other out. No. no. People are experts at putting one, two, and three-inch razor-sharp blades on the bound on their feet. Mm -hmm. And then they put them in a ring thrashing each other. I'm making such a point of it, folks, because even if you're listening and you're not an animal lover, Realize that there's another victim at these things. Children. Think of a child watching a respected uncle, a father, a mother, drinking, getting drunk, laughing, making money, gambling, on the backbone of watching animals kill each other. Mm. What does that do to the child's sanctity for life? And why are we surprised that if they can watch a dog trash another dog and kill it, and their parents are excited, why are we surprised that they can throw a hand grenade into a group of people when they're in their 20s or shoot off a sniper rifle yeah. or an AR-15? We've destroyed their sanctity for life with those things. They're abhorrent. That is incredible. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, this has just been a fantastic uh, conversation. And uh, if you want to tell people where to find your book, because I, <laughs> I think you had so many more stories. We've just barely dived into okay. them. So. Lions, tigers, and hamsters. And not lions and tigers and bears, oh my, but close. Yeah. Lions and tigers and hamsters. It also goes by uh, what um, animals taught me about love, life, and humanity. And uh, yeah, it's on. It's in Amazon. It's in Borders Books. It's in most of your... You can get on online anymore. It wouldn't be necessarily on the shelf because it's about four years now. Um, but uh, if people read it, please, um, uh, you're welcome to put my website... I uh, my. Um, Email up on the board when okay, we're done. Uh, MGDVM007 at gmail.com. That's MGDVM, like Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, 007. I love James Bond at gmail.com. If you get the book, you like it, I'd love to hear from people. If you don't like it, I never heard of you. Yeah. Right. No, I'd love to hear good or bad, please. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Mark Goldstein. Uh, stay tuned. We are going to be having a second episode, which is going to dive into your diagnosis. Um, and it was which type of cancer? Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. The, the most okay. uh, aggressive thing that I'm dealing with right now is I have a diagnosis of pancreatic adenocarcinoma or pancreatic cancer. So stay tuned. We are going to dive into that episode, and we will also be blazing. Uh, I got so into the conversation that we forgot to spark <laughs> up. So we will be blazing on the next episode. Stay tuned, uh, and that will be coming on just shortly.